I think we could all talk about whiskey for several hours fairly yeah. easily. Yeah. Oh, I, don't know. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on who you ask. This episode of Bird Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you, supported through Patreon, and with partnerships brought to you by the following. For this year's Father's Day, do you want to do something different beyond a new tie? How about giving Dad his own personal tobacconist with a good cigar company subscription? Or heck, maybe you just need a good gift for yourself. The Good Cigar Company designed the first ready-to-go kit with everything you need to light up all in a handsome pack that even acts as its own humidor. Go to goodcigar.co and use promo code bourbon for 10% off any subscription and start enjoying your bourbon with new cigars from the Good Cigar Company. Sterling Cut Glass is the official whiskey and tasting glass supplier to distilleries across the country and is also the official glassware of Bourbon Pursuit. They are offering free etched samples to whiskey societies nationwide. Simply email spirits at sterlingcutglass.com, include your logo, and mention Bourbon Pursuit. Take a look at their online catalog with Glen Cairns, Copitas, Rock Glasses, Decanters, and more at bourbonpursuit.com and click on the banner for Sterling Cut Glass. Hey everyone, welcome back to another brand new episode of the official podcast of Bourbon, Bourbon Pursuit. And as usual, let's go through the news first. The Bourbon Affair is going to be taking place on June 5th through the 10th in Louisville, Kentucky. If you've never heard of it, go and check out some of the past episodes. Just go to bourbonpursuit.com, go hit Bourbon Affair, just type it in the little search bar, and you can listen to a past episode where we had Adam, that is the director of the Kentucky Bourbon Trail, on to really talk about it and give you an idea what it really is. I mean, it's really a fantasy camp for bourbon lovers. You get the ability to get intimate settings with master distillers, uh, and other industry kind of titans, really. You get the ability to kind of be in these settings where you get to go to dinner at their houses, go to skeet shooting with the Russells. A lot of cool different stuff. And we're going to be there recording a few sessions at the Higher Proof Expo, which is sort of like a, a breakout session learning type of uh, scenario that's going to be happening at the Omni in downtown Louisville. You should be there because these podcasts are not going to come out for quite some time. Plus, we're not going to be able to record them all. We're only doing four of like 16 or 20 sessions. So you need to go there and check them out. And, you know, it's really cool that we get to do this to help you know, partner up with the uh, the Bourbon Affair and bring some of these sessions to you because I think that you're going to listen and you're going to actually want to come and you're going to want to be there next year. So go to kybourbonaffair.com. Check out what events haven't sold out yet, such as all the barrel picks. Those are all gone. Of course they are. But you can go to kybourbonaffair.com and see what other things that you want to go do. Our next barrel pick has been set. And maybe it's really not a barrel pick at all. It's our Maker's Mark 46 Select Private Blend. This is where we get to go and choose different staves and blend it all together and figure out which type of Maker's 46 concoction that we want to be able to do. And with a special kind of icing on the top is what we get to do is we are bringing one special lucky Patreon member with us to help create this blend. If you are a Patreon member at $10 or more per month, make sure you go and you check out the link where we had to sign up to be able to go and you can get your opportunity to come with us and help blend this new Makers 46 pick. And if you're also interested about our last barrel pick we did this week, you can go and check it out on YouTube. It was with Barrel Bourbon with two R's and two L's. This was something where we are doing a barrel split with Blake from Bourboner.com. And you can go to YouTube, watch as Blake, Ryan, and I go and we sample through all of them. And we come away with a, a pretty general consensus. Not only that, as we came away with a new name to it as well. Thank you to everybody that was there watching live and on the comments. So we can expect something with the name Serial Killer coming out. And that's going to be an inside joke. So you make sure you go to YouTube and you, uh, you check out why that it's going to be named Serial Killer. And this month's Patreon rewards are going to be barrel themed as well. Because we've got the opportunity for you to go and actually get 
samples from what we had sampled from. So you're gonna, the first winner is actually gonna get samples of all the barrels that we had to choose from. You also, uh, some other winners are gonna get something of, uh, you get to try the Infinite Barrel Project, uh, Barrel Bourbon Rye, as well as a Barrel Bourbon Batch 15, as well as some other kind of cool swag and stuff like that as well. T-shirts, uh, beanies, tote bags, all that sort of cool stuff. And you have to make sure you sign up today because today is the last day of May. And as soon as it rolls over today, then we choose the winner of May. So if you want to get into it, make sure you go and you sign up at patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. The bourbon community roundtable is always a fan favorite, and we're glad to see so much participation that actually happened on this holiday weekend. You know, it was Memorial Day. We were actually recording on Sunday. So if you weren't aware of it happening, that's my fault because I accidentally sort of time crunched myself. You're going to get a little bit more heads up next time, but it was great to have uh, almost, again, 50 viewers on, uh, people that were watching actually during Game 7 as well. So it was uh, it was quite entertaining, so I hope everybody enjoys this week's episode. And do make sure that if you love the podcast, help support it. Go to patreon.com slash bourbonpursuit, because that's really what helps keep this show going. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on wherever you get your podcast, whether it's iTunes or Stitcher or, I don't know, keep going. The list goes on and on and on. And if you are interested in the video podcast, make sure you subscribe to us on Facebook or follow us on Facebook, like us on Facebook, as well as subscribe to us on YouTube. And you can get all those new episodes. They'll just be, uh, you'll get, get notifications for them, right? This whole world works on push notifications, it seems like. And also make sure that you are following us on those great social media channels, Twitter, Instagram, as well as Facebook. And if you want every new episode, hit in your inbox, go to burnpursuit.com, hit the email button, type in your email, and you're going to get those Thursday morning at 7 a.m. With that, Enjoy this week's episode. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast, the official podcast of bourbon. This is the 21st edition of the Bourbon Community Roundtable. It's a crowd favorite. It's a fan favorite. It is also a Memorial Day weekend sort of surprise one that's happening because we didn't really announce it. Um, I guess that was my bad. I probably should have put in a little bit more of a a warning out there and maybe shot up some flares because we got a uh we got a i don't know a thin lineup tonight we got a uh a, we got the uh just the the core core team here i guess you could say and then we've got a kind of just a few viewers on but with that we've got a you know a few good we got a few good topics tonight i think we're gonna keep it lively we're gonna keep it going it's a lot of topics that everybody always loves to discuss. It always happens on YouTube Live. Usually happens on a Tuesday. Um, I appreciate everybody kind of taking time out of their day. I know this doesn't come out till Thursday, but I got to leave town this week, so that means I've got a full day of editing and publishing and uh, promoting tomorrow. So I uh, appreciate these guys jumping on. But let's go ahead and start with a man that is a some you know he's a, he's been on here before with the round table, but he's not a always a regular. So Max Christie, welcome back to the show. Thanks, man. It's really good to be here as always. So um, go ahead and tell everybody where you blog at and where they can find you because I think we're uh, we're out number we're outnumbered by Florida tonight. We got you. We we fared through the tropical storm Alberto and we Came out the other side strong. Yeah, I'm Max. I run Superfly Bourbon Club with my best friend, Mike. We're on Instagram, social media, and of course, superflybourbonclub.com. I do have to apologize. Been a little bit of a hiatus lately. I just got married. Mike just Congrats. moved from California to Seattle. So we've been lagging a little bit, but we've got two or three good articles that should be popping up within the next week or so. So check us out now so you can see them when they come out. Awesome. And I'm going to bring that up as one of the other topics that we're going to talk about too, because I remember you coming here for a bachelor party and I think we should probably hit on some of the, the good spots to hit on, but Jordan, I'll let you go next. Cool. So this is Jordan from breaking bourbon.com. I'm one of three guys who runs the site. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at breaking bourbon. You can also find us on Patreon at the same handle. Um, you know, we do really great articles, reviews, and of course our up to date daily release calendar find out what's coming and going in the bourbon world. And Blake, as usual, you got you to keep your streak going. This is Blake from bourboner.com. I don't like to make the editing process easy on Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> I just screw something up at least every time I'm on here. So he has to go through and just wait till he sees my mouth move. And then he knows that's when it's time to edit. <laughs> but um, you can find me at bourboner.com, all the social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube channel, um, yep. Yeah, reviews, different posts, all kinds of stuff. So check it out. 
Well, good. So while we were on our editing break right there, Jordan said he had a, a funny story that, or maybe a fun story. I don't know, whatever it's it fun, is. So this was a, this was a fun story. So I was down in, let's see, it was the weekend before Derby in Louisville. It was the day before I stopped over and got my bottles from your place, uh, Kenny. So me and my wife are in Trader Joe's right down on the front near the Frankfurt area, uh, Frankfurt Ave. And, uh, it was really funny. So we're just doing our shopping and this guy comes up to me and he taps me on the shoulder. He's like, Oh, excuse me. Do I, um, I think I know you. And in my head, I'm like, Oh, well, I used to live in Louisville. Did we work together? This is going to be really embarrassing. And I look at him I'm like, man, I have no idea who you are. I was like, ah, and thankfully I'm wearing my breaking bourbon shirt. And he points to, it and he's like, Oh, Oh yeah. I, uh, I really like your website and I love watching you guys do those, those round table videos. And I was like, you gotta be kidding. And thankfully my wife was there to witness this cause she's like cracking up. But like he was the nicest guy in the world. Right. I'm like, Holy crap. Can't believe this is happening. So Her shout out to celebrity. shout out to Chris. He was wearing a CrossFit t-shirt. If I ran into you and Trader Joe's just wanted to say what's up. Um, <laughs> that was actually a really fun, really cool moment. That's what I said. The next day with someone else, which is even more weird. I'm here to make you guys famous. I don't think you realize that. <laughs> We have one goal here. <laughs> That's it. My uh, my two seconds of fame was was used up, but it felt good. <laughs> it was funny. It was funny you say that. Um, and I was actually texting uh, one of the people that I know that that runs a store here in town. And yeah, he sent me a bottle or sent me a picture the other day. He's like, "What do you know about this like Jefferson's weeded mash bill?" And you know, basically just asked me for opinions yeah. on different stuff. And uh, you know, I gave my opinion and just said like, Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure it's great. Like, I don't know who they're trying to appeal to, whether it's like the, the uneducated consumer, or maybe it's the educated <laughs> consumer that is looking for the next thing. Like who knows. Right. But anyway, and I was, and I said, you know, like I finished up just like, Hey, have, how are you doing? I haven't talked to you in a while. He said, good, good, good. You know, how are you been? I was like, Oh man, the podcast is great and whatever. And he's like, what podcast? And so I sent him like the links to everything. And he goes, I didn't know you're like bourbon famous. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> No, I was like, I, I don't know if we're there yet. We we got a we got a well, we got a little ways to go until that point comes. But it's it's a fine line between bourbon famous and just spending too much time talking about bourbon and posting <laughs> about bourbon. <laughs> bourbon obsessed is probably a much better term for for where I'm at at this point. <laughs> there yeah, you go. It, it could be. I mean, I, I think, think what we the... yeah, exactly. I think what we do is just uh we 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 take it to the next level where we're like, oh yeah, we can we can just take this as a, a side hobby that then ends up becoming almost 50% <laughs> of our normal time that we should be spending on our yeah. actual time, right? So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, one thing that kind of came up at the very beginning during the introductions there was, you know, Max, first off, congratulations on getting married. Um, hope you were able to crack a nice bottle of something on that, that uh, you know, the night of marriage. Um, definitely, know. definitely. Yeah. Good. But I know that you had reached out to us during your planning stages because you were actually doing your bachelor party around Bardstown. So I want you to just kind of talk about that for a little bit, kind of places you hit, just to kind of give other people a sense of idea of if they're wanting to plan a, a boys weekend or maybe a girls weekend, I don't know, like whatever it is, like they can, they can come to uh, Kentucky and kind of get their thrills. So what were the things that you did? Well, my trip was didn't exactly go as planned because there was a snowstorm that weekend. So, for example, we had planned on you know the usual. Oh, was that the weekend what, here that we had the snowstorm? Yeah, it was like oh yeah, maybe that was a week or two before you guys did your Buffalo Trace Barrel pick. Oh, that and was with, that was a bad weekend. Yeah, I remember yeah, that. Willett. We stayed four miles away from Willett in an Airbnb, and you know the plan. You, know, you go to Willett twice a day while you're there. That's just what you do. And they were closed the entire time we were there because oh. of snow. And but it was it was cool. Four Roses was still open. The bottling plant. We went out there. You know, did the tour. Uh, I was lucky they actually had uh, some OESO in the gift shop, which is my favorite recipe. So I grabbed a couple of those. Nice. Uh, we went out to Bourbon Thirty. Hung out with Jeff. Ran into Ed Bly. And then went over to Local Feed, which is a restaurant bar out there. Hung out there for the night. Came back, did, you know, of course, the Heaven Hill connoisseur experience. You know, it kind of saves the, not so much the tour and the 51% oh, corn, 160 proof, you know, the whole spiel. They just let you taste all their top shelf stuff. So that was nice. 
Uh, honestly, there's some fuzzy parts of the trip. <laughs> <laughs> With, it should be. It's a bachelor party, right? I yeah. went to some. I, I wish I could tell you where it was, but Ed Bly told us about it after we left his shop in Crescent Springs. We went to, it was like above a pizza place somewhere, and they had probably 30 different Willets. And we tried a C1B, which is, you know, 130 proof, uh, supposedly old Bernheim weeder. Only 26 bottles ever made or 31 ever made. Literally couldn't tell you where I tried that at, but. <laughs> Were you already pretty keen at that I remember drinking it. Yeah. I have pictures of it. <laughs> Don't you love how some sometimes those great bottles get tasted at the end of the night when people start bringing stuff out and you're like, well, it tasted like bourbon and that's about all I remember. <laughs> I remember it was amazing. Yeah. Why? Oh. Yeah, I know. Really, really good time that. though. Plan on coming back again towards the end of the year. Do some, hopefully do some barrel picks out there with, with a local group. Nice. Oh, cool. You know, it was funny, Blake, you say that and I'll kind of gauge your all's input on this too. Um, you know, when people do start bringing out some of those heavy hitters, I mean, are you the type of people that like all of a sudden you've got like one of those bourbon or leather notepads in your back pocket and you're <laughs> going to start write, writing notes on it? Or are you kind of like yeah. a, a mental person? You kind of just sit there in the moment and you kind of just drink it. Like what, what are y'all's takes? Because I've seen I've seen actually multiple people like, um, you know, when we were at the, the Willet Bar opening uh, for that. And I saw a few people that were sitting there trying some of those things that, you know, of course, you'll never get the chance to try it again because a lot of people were basically buying the entire bottles that night and <laughs> they were, they were like, okay, I'm going to take this opportunity and I'm going to try it. I'm going to write down my tasting notes so I can remember huh. everything, all this other kind of stuff. So I don't know, like what, what, what do you all usually do? Uh, on that kind of stuff, I'm usually just enjoying it. Uh, you know, occasionally if I'm at like some event, I, I may take notes on, on stuff, especially if I know I want to like put a review on the blog later. Um, uh, um, but in general, I'm just sitting there trying to drink it, enjoy it, have a good time, try to remember as much as I can about it. You know, um, I feel like I can still remember a lot of pours that I've had. Uh, and it, going back and reading tasting notes about it doesn't necessarily always jog my memory other than just really thinking about it. Um, but my mind works, works a little more visual like that. So I try to visualize while I'm tasting it what I'm tasting. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't want to be the guy who's like, everyone's having a great time. It's like, hold on, everyone quiet down. Who has a pen? Who has a, uh, let me get my notebook. <laughs> Got it. You know, I wouldn't be able to write. I can barely read my own handwriting now. I can't imagine trying to read it after I've had a few drinks and I'm writing bourbon notes. So, Oh, totally. Now I'm, I'm kind of one of those people that I'm kind of there at the moment sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, Jordan, what about you? Yeah, I think I'm this I'm I'm the same way. I don't really write anything down. I think the most it'll be is maybe if I'm not with Eric and Nick at the time, I'll take a picture mm -hmm. of what I'm drinking and send it over like a really literally when I mean a short description, I mean like three or four words like, oh, this is really amazing. It tastes like X, right? Um, like you know, or if honey us are there. Yeah. So like, but like the really good bottles stay in your memory forever, right? Like me and Eric were Nick wasn't able to join us, but me and Eric were at a great uh, bourbon bar in I think Pittsburgh. And like there's a bottle of EC22. Right. So like we each got a big pour and it was freaking phenomenal at that point. Right. It was delicious. And I remember like that, like those, those types of bottles, those special ones, like the taste just stays in, uh, stays with you. That's again, assuming though, that you're not like, you know, 15 deep in the night. And at that point, it's just not like it tastes like bourbon, which is always the worst, yeah. right? That, that literally is the worst when you're like having a great time. And then a really good bottle comes out and you're like, I am not going to appreciate this bottle as much <laughs> as I would have. If this was like the first thing we tried, but yeah, uh, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's you know, sometimes, sometimes good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's there's a few people in chat. So uh twenty two says I'll just make a note whether I want to buy a bottle for myself. Oh, there you go. And John Brown says he actually keeps a spreadsheet in Google Docs um, as a kind of a, a running tally. Uh, but he says it'll update while he's still sober. And, and, and that kind of leads to a, another discussion is kind of like a, a lack of apps, right? I mean, yeah. when you look at when you look at like the craft beer world, um, there is um, untapped. Uh, I don't know. I mean, freaking beer advocate, like keep going, right? Like there's so many things that happen in the beer world. And not only that, in the wine world too, right? There's There's – there's a there's a app where you can literally have a camera and scroll it across a label and then like see 
reviews like as it comes up, right? And I, I believe that Blake and Ryan and I were talking about this um, a little bit last week that the the whiskey world is like I don't I I don't even want to put a percentage to it, but it is so small in comparison to what you can do in the craft beer world as well as the wine world to say that okay, sure there might you could go a, a not a day in your life and try a different craft beer or a different wine, but if you try to do that with the with a bourbon. Yep. Maybe a year, maybe two years. I don't know. It depends on how many craft stuff you want to get into. Oh. But it, we there's actually a lot of there's like a lack of apps that are out there to be able to kind of um keep track of that. I mean, are, are you guys seeing anything in regards of app development or things that you use to be able to keep track of like stuff like that? No, we we've actually so we've toyed around with the idea and we've had a few people approach us in the past too. And you know, at least our view, right? When we come down to it. It's, it's true. So the craft beer world, the wine world, especially craft beer, right? There's always new places popping up, always like, even if it's just a local distillery that you love, right? Think about it. They're running through different new recipes, different through new combos, different new beers all the time. In a bourbon world, especially depending on where you are, your access when you go to bars, you might only see like the same 30 or 40 things, right? Let's take like Kentucky and Louisville aside, right? Or like if you're lucky to live in a big city with a good bourbon bar, but, like the average person out there, they're not going to be able to so, like use the app a little bit and then like your second or third week using it, you're like, yeah, I kind of ran out of new stuff to taste. Like maybe I'll revisit this app a few months down the road. And if you don't, if you don't use it, you're just going to forget about it. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's part in our world. That's part of the problem that I think about often. Yeah. I can imagine you probably go to a bunch of restaurants and it's the same thing. It's it's right. Over and over. Basil, you know, whatever, not great. And then once you, I mean, if you're not going to use the app all the time because you don't have the opportunity to, it's kind of just like, you're just not going to keep using it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think someone will make one eventually. I mean, we have a will it app now. So, I mean, there's people <laughs> doing these kind of things. I just think it's a matter of time for someone to do it. And then, yeah, I think that's the challenge is, yeah, it's, you can make it. I'll download it. But how are you going to get people to keep using it? That's the whole thing. And, and there's been a few of them. There's been, uh, well, Distiller is the popular one. Yeah. Um, but then there was one called Barreled. Um, one called, shoot, I still have it. Um, your app graveyard folder. <laughs> is it that, that, app that never made it to light yeah, well, what that's, happened that, that? that's what i was going to say so the bourboner app that that was the idea that that's kind of what yeah. got bourboner started was to have this place um and the things i ran into were one i'm not a developer so to do it was really expensive and the blog just kind of took took uh you know took off a little more than the app ever did and two you know what we just talked about there's 400 500 you know if you include all whiskeys then it gets a little bit broader but the problem is the monetization of it um yeah. where somebody like untapped they have all these um they have all these different breweries and bars and everything craft beer bars are popping up all over the place it, the bourbon and whiskey market just isn't as big as craft beer is from a broad standpoint. Um, you know, maybe monetarily they're about the same, but it, it's just tough to monetize. So you couldn't even do something where you put like a buy button in there and take a commission because you can't do that unless you have a license. So, you know, the whole thing is, is just really hard to figure out. And I mean, we all know it, the bourbon the bourbon world basically happens on Facebook and Instagram and some Twitter, um, you know, Reddit kind of has its own thing, but for the most part, I'd say it's 80% Facebook is where all the bourbon conversation happens. And so trying to move that from a platform, people are already on to your app. That's just, that's a tough thing to do. Um, and you know, most of it, most of the time, people are just talking about controversy and that kind of stuff anyway. So, is Jack yeah. Daniels a bourbon? Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> dun, app, dun, dun. the app, it's just like, all right, here's my review, here's what I thought. Um, yeah. So, it's kind of like a good thing to have in the toolkit because you may be in the store, but to be an actual active user, that's that's even that's well, a and tough I think task. I think John Brown has the right idea. I mean, you don't even need an app if you're in the store, just go to Breaking Bourbon, get your review, you're good to go. <laughs> 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 they got everything. You, get, you gotta go look at their index, right? Just I mean, like that's what I do. That's yeah. 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 bourbonglossary.com, right? Yeah. No, I, I think you bring up a good uh, a lot of good points there, Blake, because I think the monetization is really hard because of the I mean, there's there's 
tens of thousands of craft breweries that are spread all across the United States. And I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're in Jacksonville or whether you're in Houston, Texas, or whether you're in San Diego, California. Yeah, you could pull it up and yeah, there could be an ad that says, yeah, come to the craft brewery that's five miles away from your house, right? Um, and it's it's an easy way to be able to use geolocation to get that sort of stuff. Whereas you're not going to find that in a, in a whiskey app to be able to get people there and rarely are they going to buy something, but at least they maybe take a tour, right? Like, yeah. um, and so I think it's a lot easier to get people to hang out at a beer garden for a few hours than it is to sit there and like, you know, buy a bottle of whiskey or take a tour. Mm -hmm. but, and the, the regulations are a lot easier for tap rooms in most states than they are for distilleries. Um, I found the other one it was called distilled, but no E. So... Like bourbon, or they drop the e from the <laughs> <laughs> and a lot. You should have but figured out some cool of the Mark. Yeah, Mark had dropped e somehow. I think the guy right? worked on it. I think the guy worked on it for a year or so, and then moved on to a different uh, project. Where you know, it's it's just tough. I mean, most of y'all kind of know the industry probably better than I do, but the app world is a competitive market, and grabbing people's attention is not easy. So, no, not everybody can be HQ trivia. No, <laughs> that that still amazes me. So I was explaining that to somebody on Friday night because it popped up. We're at dinner, and I'm like, "Oh, it's HQ time." He's like, "Oh, what is that?" And we get on there. There's like two million people, and that thing is unbelievable. Yeah. So if anyone's giving me a free life, uh, download HQ and use uh, uh, Bourboner as your. No, no, I'd say I'd say uh, referral code K A C O L E two, and then uh, I'll go ahead and take my free lives from there. <laughs> So let's go ahead and move on to our, our next topic, right? I think um, one thing that we like to uh, talk about a lot is a little bit of how we like to hate on distributors a little bit because of this either false sense of scarcity, so scarcity. But really, I think the the biggest problem that's come is that I don't know. Maybe maybe we finally did our jobs, or that maybe we don't have a loud enough voice. It's one or the other because we've been talking about Henry McKenna for a year, two years now doing these podcasts. And then all of a sudden, one thing comes out about them winning best bourbon at a little tiny competition out in San Francisco. And then all of a sudden, we start seeing these things of, oh, everything's on allocation now for Henry McKenna. Like, are you guys seeing a lot of scarcity that's being driven in, in your parts of the country as well? Because I can tell you from, at least for me, I actually got a text message from a buddy that um, helps run a very, very large liquor chain here in Louisville. And he said, um, you know, before, probably about a month and a half ago, I could order 100 cases of Henry McKenna and get them no problem. Now, I can only get one. Get out of here. Really? Dead serious. Huh. Right? So, and that's happening here in Louisville, and that just happened last week. So, what are you all seeing in your parts of the country, or is it just kind of business as usual still? I was actually in a liquor store the other day. It was uh, one of my locals, and I was, you know, just doing the usual, rolling through, saying hi to everybody. I think I grabbed some beer, and I'm walking through that, and I saw a guy with just taking all of them. Really? He probably had eight or ten of them in his cart, and he was taking every single one and pushing them out. So, like I didn't stop to talk to him, but I just kind of shook my head and walked by. Like it's it's hap it's happening around here. Huh. Yeah, so we I heard uh, locally that um, kind of similar situation where a store I know went to order some and they were told that Total Wine had basically taken the entire allocation for the area um, after the announcement of the – and then, you know, Total Wine had this big blast. I don't know exactly how true that is. You know, you kind of got to take what uh, people say with a grain of salt sometimes, but it, it's just – you know, I think everyone gets in on the hype. A guy hears it one and thinks it's going to be the next Pappy and he's going to resell it for who knows what and he's going to go out and grab eight to ten bottles. Mm -hmm. There's just yeah. no reason to do that, really. Um, I mean, it's great for the brands and everything but um, and the stores, I guess. But uh, in reality, there's just no point of just clearing shelves on these no. – it's not a, it's above average bourbon but you know these everyday bottles um but you know i'm still one that believes that 
Uh, distributors also do this on purpose. Something like this happens, they tell stores, oh, this is now on allocation. We can only, you can only order one case a week or something like that. Um, not that the supply really changed that much, but then, you know, the store, it's on allocation. They tell their customers, oh, we can only get six bottles of this in, but we'll give you a call. Well, that just is the whole snowball process. And then pretty soon we just won't see Henry McKenna on store shelves anymore. Um, and we've done it to ourselves. So I hope you, I hope you like it. <laughs> So I, the I, way of special reserve. I mean, I think it's Fred Minnick. <laughs> I think a little bit of is so you can still, you know, PA state run, you can still find plenty here. And I was just up in Michigan the other weekend. I can find it over there. I think we've been preaching. It's a really good, inexpensive bottle, right? It's not the be all end all, but for the price, it's a good bottle, right? Would I recommend stocking up on 20? By no means. No, right. You want to get one or two? Sure. Whatever. But um, I think that's part of the problem. One, it's pretty, it's pretty affordable, right? So people can just like grab some and have have a bunch. They're, I'll say it, they're they're a little bit crazy if they think they're gonna make a big buck on this. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of like it goes back to, uh, I mean, others do it too, right? With with Buffalo Trace, you know, people can't find Buffalo Trace and they freak out when they see it on the shelves, like, oh, we haven't seen this in forever. You go to a CVS in Louisville and there's like six deep there, right? And you're like, wait, this is CVS and it has Buffalo Trace, so it's, it is truly gonna be distributor by distributor. And uh, I wish they'd like take note of what's happening around elsewhere in the country to realize screwing over my local customer doesn't help me because everyone can just realize that I'm truly screwing them over, right? Like I'm screwing over this market. If I can talk to people and say, oh, I can get some still in Michigan. I can get some still in Cincy. I can get some still in Austin. Like well, what's that helping out besides making you hate your local distributor more? Right. I, I can at least say I, I have it on at least a fairly decent word that from uh, the depths of Headland Hill, that they are not going to be removing age statements or changing anything. Uh, they're not like pumping out more Henry McKenna. It's just business as usual for them. Um, so they're not going to be changing anything with that. I've actually seen the Henry McKenna bottling line for anybody that hasn't. It's still actually done by hand. Uh, really? Like Elijah Craig and uh, Evan Williams and some other things that are, I mean, it's just automated to the T, right? But I've actually seen the Henry McKedick bottle line and it looks, it, it's actually done right in the spot where they do um, William Heaven Hill and a few other like hmm. small ones, right? It's literally, it's literally like a two folding out tables where people sit there and hand write all this other kind of crap, right? But, you know, the other thing that is kind of interesting about this is that sure, people go out and they try to buy it up. But I think a lot of people that are in the know, they actually know better, right? Um, when you look at, if somebody actually tries to go and they buy a case of this, they buy two cases and think they're going to flip it for profit or think that it's going to be valuable here in a year, six years or anything like that, I think they're wrong because if they're going to try and go and try to sell it, the problem is, is that the bourbon market is too savvy to know that Henry McKenna is not going to pull anything more than its retail value, right? So even if it's like, it's not going to be flying off the shelves to the point where it's just, it, people are going to start paying 90 bucks for a bottle of Henry McKenna. I just don't see it ever happening. Um, you know, and, and the other side of that is that, I, I like I said, Heaven Hill is just going to keep pumping out what they have. And so there's not going to be anything else. And keep this in mind is that next year there's going to be a new winner Right. And so the cycle is just going to start over again. And so at some point people are going to forget about this. Right. Yep. Well, there's some crown. What was, what was it? Crown rye. Is that the crown one? Apple maybe. Who knows? Uh, right? Whatever crown one. I'm sure there's somebody sitting on three cases going, huh? How did this happen to me? I didn't see this. <laughs> oh, that Northern harvest <laughs> rye. Like, yeah, I mean, come on. Yeah. So, who knows? Maybe you'll see some discount on McKenna on Facebook pretty soon. Yeah, and that's what, that's what I was saying. I was like, just people in the groups that are trying to either sell bourbon or buy bourbon, they know better. They're not yep. going to spend the money on Henry McKenna to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. I yeah, mean, it's not worth shipping. We could say that maybe this is like uh, the early train of Weller 12, but I don't believe it because it doesn't have the, um, the mythological hierarchy of Pappy above it, right? So it's not going to have that sort of pull. Yep. But... I, I don't know. I, for me, I, I just don't see this um, going for another six to eight months of panic. I think it's just kind of like let the dust settle here and everything will be fine.
Yeah, it's gonna be just like old granddad 114 when everybody ran out, bought mm-hmm. him up a couple months, everybody talked about him, and then now they're just back on shelves getting dusty again. Yep. That's probably good. That's that's a good comparison, actually, because there was that, you know, uh everyone running around to to stock up as much as they could on the 114. Um, when all the everyone was saying it was going away. Yeah. Um, but you know, now it's just kind of business as usual with the 114 so hopefully that'll be the same you know i don't i don't want to see henry mckenna uh empty on the shelves you know or just a sticker on the shelves uh, i want to see it there available for especially for people who are new and getting into bourbon and say hey this is one you need to try so um i don't want to see those good good bourbons go away i don't know. i still have a bottle of ogd 14 sitting in the back still sealed because I, I fell into the hype. I didn't buy a case. <laughs> I bought one extra bottle. So, yeah. But, you know, that's a no, good I extra do. bottle to have, too. It's a delicious yeah. bourbon that you can pour for and not feel bad about. You're like, oh, all right, let's just drink those here. Yeah, you want to mix it? Sure, yeah. go for it. So we can either talk about Spirits competition or we can keep talking about uh, Heaven Hill. What do you all want to move on to? This episode of Bourbon Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you, supported through Patreon, and with partnerships brought to you by the following. Are you looking for a brand new idea for dad this year? Or maybe just a sweet gift for yourself? You know, we've talked about it on past episodes that cigars and bourbon are a match made in heaven. But figuring out what cigars you enjoy can be an expensive journey, especially when it comes to figuring out the sticks you like, owning a humidor, the maintenance, and much more. That's all changing because the good cigar company is here to be your own personal tobacconist. For $30, you get everything you need for enjoying cigars with your bourbon. The Good Cigar Company makes it simple. Just pick a strength level, and they send you top-shelf cigars at a great price. But it's more than just the sticks. You get everything you need to light those bad boys up, including a cutter. And if you don't smoke often, don't worry, because the pack acts as its own humidor, so the cigars stay fresh for months. Go check out Good Cigar Company at goodcigar.co and use promo code BOURBON for 10% off any subscription and begin the patio season with a good bourbon and relaxing smoke from Good Cigar Company. Sterling Cut Glass is the official whiskey and tasting glass supplier to distilleries across the country and is also the official glassware of Bourbon Pursuit. Sterling has contracted with the finest European crystal factories to bring the best quality glassware into their Kentucky warehouse and production facility. If you've been following us on social media, you'll see how their deep etched glassware is truly the best in the industry. I know because I searched up and down the internet to find out who was the best. Come to find out, Sterling Cut Glass supplies almost all the distilleries on the bourbon trail, and they're also the official glassware of the PGA Tournament and the Kentucky Derby. Make your logo shine on Capita nosing glasses, Glen Cairns, Neat Tasters, Rocks, Tumblers, and more. They're offering free etched samples to whiskey societies nationwide. Simply email spirits at sterlingcutglass.com, include your logo, and mention Bourbon Pursuit. Take a look at their online catalog by going to bourbonpursuit.com and clicking on the banner for Sterling Cut Glass. So we can either talk about spirits competition or we can keep talking about uh, Heaven Hill. What do you all want to move on to? Well, it's kind of one and the same, isn't it? And haven't they basically <laughs> dominated the spirits competition this all of 2018? I mean... Well, I mean, I, you know, it just I know they're putting out their good bourbon, but uh, who are they paying off to? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, just in regards to spirit competitions, I mean, this just kind of goes to show you, and, and I know Blake, we talked about this um, earlier this week, of just about how many there actually are. I know that San Francisco gets a lot of the attention, and maybe they have a little bit more credibility, but you know, there's nothing to say that the uh, there couldn't be a bourbon community roundtable competition. Uh, I think there should be. Distillers just need to send in a bottle, a thousand dollar application fee. <laughs> get ready. We'll award you a medal of some sort. And yeah. and yeah. you guys are the Photoshop king, so I'm sure you can come up with some <laughs> awesome medal. Right. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. It uh it, it never ceases to amaze me, just you know, you you get a lot of press releases, that kind of stuff. It's like, you know, this bourbon won the I think we talked about it on here, but like the Beverly Hills, um, whiskey competition or the international whiskey competition of 
of North America. It's like, hold on, what? These aren't even making sense anymore in the titles. Like, it's kind of an oxymoron. Um, but you know what? Then stuff like this happens with Henry McKenna and everybody's buying it. So that just kind of fuels the fire for these competitions when um, I think it was on, I'm not going to say the distillery, um, but I saw on Facebook somebody was like, hey, you know, you're saying you won go double gold medal here. You don't actually distill. And they said, well, we distill, but just at somebody else's facility. And they're like, <laughs> okay, so if I take a recipe and hand it to a chef and he wins a Michelin, four, <laughs> or, you know, Michelin star, is that my Michelin star or is that the chef's, you know? Um, I just hand him a back of, or it was a Kraft mac and cheese box, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> he brought his own Parmesan, right? But there's yeah. just a lot of that, you know, every, every brand has something that they put on there and, and still we, you know, we've gone over this, but still my biggest pet peeve is having 10 layers of awards starting with best in category that's like the worst you can get is best in category then you can get gold then you can get double gold then you can go platinum then you can you know be ultra super platinum you know it's just everyone's make it a little Literally more everyone's yeah winner. yeah and we talked about with this with wade woodard but he was saying i think out of the 2000 submissions to the san francisco wine competition something like 1900 of them won a medal so <laughs> You know, are, are we trying to say this is an actual competition? Um, because my son's four-year-old T-ball league is more competitive than you know, nineteen hundred out of two thousand get a medal. Um, yeah, so, you know, that that's my biggest pet peeve is make them real competitions if you're going to make a, a competition. Yep. Cool. So, what do um, or Jordan? Do you have anything else you want to add there? Or? I was just saying, I'm looking forward to Hot Dickle winning their double gold next year. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. that's not a knock on Hot Dickle by any means. That was more um, surprising yeah. than you thought it would be. I, did, I didn't actually get a bottle of it to, to taste a review. Um, I don't know if you guys have, but go ahead and kind of talk about that one too, real quick. I think so. For those of you who don't know, so Hot Dickle is from Dickle, right? They took. Tabasco Barrel, so quick backstory, and we just did a huge write-up on the website if you need a bigger backstory, but Tabasco is actually aged for three years in old Jack Daniels barrels, so it's actually like a pretty like laborious product. When you see Tabasco on the shelf, like it has some history to it. It's pretty cool. So what Dickel did was they took those barrels of used Tabasco, um, barrel rested some Dickel in it, right? Cut it down to 70 proof, added a little bit of, uh, I don't want to say flavoring because they didn't do it. They redistilled Tabasco sauce to add to it, so it's not like it's artificial by any means and uh it has a little bit of a zip to it it's not like a fireball per se eric's tasting his notes are on there but uh we're really curious to see more so what people are going to do with cocktails right it's not a foolproof it's 70 proof bourbon it's not like you're gonna have a glass and sit on your porch and sip it all the time but i think it is an interesting way of um just you know bringing a, a something that you think very american tabasco sauce and adding something you know very american whiskey to it and uh, going from there but it's definitely something that we called it out when we saw, when we saw it back in December. I think it flew under the radar. Then it came out, and when we posted that bottle the first time on social media, before people even had a chance to try it, they were ripping the hell out of it. And uh, you know, one they called it Hot Dickle, which is its unofficial <laughs> nickname. So I feel like they kind of brought it upon themselves. But uh, nickname aside, it's one of those. It's super polarizing, right? And um, it'll be interesting as more yeah. people get a chance to try it. I haven't tried it, but I actually like the um, like the idea of it because yeah, I, yeah, sure. I mean, um, it, and maybe it's just because I rem I just remember watching a How It's Made episode from I think it was on the History Channel or something. And they did yeah. Tabasco and yeah. how it was aged in old bourbon barrels or you know technically t Tennessee whiskey barrels. <laughs> um, but you know, it's to me, I'd rather them take a step out in that kind of way to say, sure. hey. Can, can there is some tie in here? It's not a complete. It, it's gimmicky for sure, but it's just not like a complete like, um, I don't know, slapstick kind of release. Um, yeah. Then you know, just to say, well, we're going to release another bourbon, and it's going to be the exact same thing we've always released, but we're going to have a new backstory, and you know, try something different every now and then. So, um, I haven't tried it yet, but I may grab a bottle. It looks pretty cool, and it. I feel like it's one of those ones that. When people see the bottle, they're like, "Oh, let me try that." Let me, yeah, you know they, they yeah, want exactly. to get a shot at least. Yeah. Like John Brown said in the comments, it'd probably make a good Bloody Mary. 
Yeah, and I think yeah. you know, there's people who make a bloody better bloody mary than I. So, and, and Nick and Eric too. So, I think I'm looking forward to seeing what some bartender comes up with. There'll be some good recipes coming out of this one. It's not like you know, other distilleries. It's not not to knock on anyone, but it's not like you're going to see like a cinnamon flavored whiskey that's artificially flavored, right? This like has a little bit of backstory and history to it. Yes, it's definitely gimmicky by all means, but it falls on the less gimmicky of gimmicky scales. You know, to Blake's point. I might be in the minority here because whenever I see something, that, don't get me wrong, I love cocktails. Like whenever I go out, whether it's a bar or a restaurant, whatever, I'm always ordering cocktails because I rarely ever go to a bar and order a bourbon neat because let's face it, we all own every bottle they probably have at the bar, right? So I always order cocktails, but whenever I see something that says like jalapeno infu infused or like anything like that, like spicy, I'm always like, eh, -eh not for oh, me. Really? Not going to do it. I'm just, I'm just not a big fan of like pepper and spice infused sort of oh, cocktails. That's fair. That's fair. That's right. I think it's not for pepper. I'm like, I your drink spicy is, one. or spicy in your drink is a, it's a, you, you got to be in the right mood. I feel like that's not a dinner time thing. That's more of like a, a brunch time thing. Um, to have a spicy drink. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you there. But don't get me wrong. I love brunch. I will brunch with all <laughs> y'all anytime. <so. laughs> Next time you're in Florida, in the week. brunch capital <laughs> yeah. of America. <laughs> We'll, we'll brunch so hard one day. Um, <laughs> yeah. So kind of a, another topic that I wanted to hit on as well. Um, again, going back to the Heaven Hill thing. And I know uh, most people have gotten to try it. I haven't yet to try it. I do have a bottle of it finally. Finally got it uh, this past week. Was the old Fitzgerald bottled and bond, the pretty new decanter that came out. And everybody is sort of polarized on it, right? Um, I think from the most part, from what I've read of people that I trust in the reviews, it's a meh. Um, there's of course a lot of people that say like, oh, it's the best bourbon ever, but maybe they're trying to justify their purpose. I don't know. I haven't tried it myself. Their purchase. Um, so before we, <laughs> before we get into just like the idea of just decanters like coming back in style like yeah. i don't want to kind of just gauge you all that, that who's actually tried it uh, again i know uh, blake you had a uh, probably a 45 minute review on it but if you could boil it down in like 30 seconds that'd be great um, but anybody else that'd like to just chime in on just the just the review of the whiskey in itself if there's anything that you found particularly interesting or special or not special about it yeah so i mean my my quick review was it just wasn't very good it was to me it was hot it had some some interesting notes up front, but it just came off really hot, dry finish, um, and, and I didn't really like it. Uh, especially, I didn't like it for one hundred and ten dollars or whatever it was. But I said it was probably the one of the best looking bottles I've seen. Um, but I saw Fred Minnick was talking about it and said he loved it. Um, so I, I'm still not convinced that this is an instance of uh, you know people have different palates, but um, you know, there may have been a couple batches. Have has anybody heard if there's multiple batches on this one? That's what I was gonna ask. I, yeah. I heard that, but I have no confirmation at all. So yeah. I'll give you I'll give you the skinny, right? So um I, I know I know somebody that works there. Um so not to <laughs> wake her up. Go, not to yeah. get my wife in trouble or anything, but at least from what I understand, and so there is going to be um so this is gonna be a spring and fall release for the next five years. There is supposedly, from what I understand, there is going to be a different color label and a different age statement and a different price for each one of them, right? Mm -hmm. So what I understand is, actually, I, I can't actually talk about any of the colors or age statements coming, but that's as much as I can tell you right now. Um, that is, But all the ones um, out there now are all exactly the same. Right now, it's all the green label, all little original, 11-year bottled and bond yes um, but there are going to be different age statements like i said different color labels uh as well as different prices for each one that's going to be coming out um if i am still understanding that they are going to keep that same bottle uh keep coming out because um if anybody that's actually gotten in or getting into the bottle business you know that uh glass molds aren't cheap uh like they're like 30 or fifty thousand dollars so they're probably going to keep doing the same class for a while so they're going to keep that runway going so that's so let me ask you this though. Do you think, and I think a lot of well, one people want to and you know, age stated and old fits again, but um, do you think a lot of that public interest, especially people who may not know bourbon too much, or when they see it on the shelves and they see the price, is the fact that they're getting a decanter out of it too, right? I mean, it's a gorgeous bottle. Let's not get ourselves, it's like really nice looking, right? 
So, okay, so you get one, you're like, cool, I got a decanter. But then like when you're like eight, nine bottles into it, right? Are you like, all right, now I got eight, nine of these. I mean, if you're just like, if you're actually truly buying it to have a decanter afterwards, like you're probably like, no, it's not for, not for me anymore. Or if you hated the first one, like, so, you know, we all watch Blake's review, good, honest review, right? If that turned you off the first time, are you going to remember that and be like, well, do I take a risk this time? Is it better? Is it worse? Like, you know, what series is going to be the best? So maybe, maybe they should be switching up the bottle to whatever cost it is. I don't know. Let's be honest. We're, we're the most, um, you know, selfish people in the world or bourbon drinkers, right? Like you're oh, going to go true. buy it. This is true. Like, but yes. It's in front of your face. You're going to go buy it. This yeah. is true. Let's be honest. I think it's just because it looks different. Like if you look at Al Young and not to knock that, that was my, one of my favorite whiskeys of last year. But if you look at what secondary prices are of that compared to any other limited edition of Four Roses from the past five or six years, that's more expensive than any of them, in my opinion, just because it looks different. So this it's one, you know, the, no other bottle that you year, see on the, the show. Twenty-three year makes in it too. So yeah, people, people yeah. always dig something that has an older thing on it. But yeah, it looks really cool sitting on the shelf next to all your other bottles. You charge a little more for it. I think we kind of saw this with Stag Junior too. Whenever it was first released, the first batch wasn't that great. Ooh, that's hot as hell. Um, yeah. yeah, but they definitely improved on it yeah. since then. Um, it just kind of surprised me. I guess when you have those barrels set aside for a certain project and you dump them and you're like, well, maybe it's not, I mean, because they know these guys have good palates, you know, they're not dumb. Um, what else do you do? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're kind of stuck at that point, you know, I, I, maybe you can add a couple more barrels here and there, but it's not like they can just scrap it, you know, dump out a, a hundred or 200 barrel uh, batch of, bourbon because they didn't like it you know it's it's kind of like well you got to release it at that point so um yeah that is interesting to hear that it's going to come out in multiple or different years and i assume higher price points even though kenny won't uh probably tell us but Honestly, I can only, I yeah so. i can only assume it'll just be higher price point but you know hopefully they they improve on it because what was it phc three four that was a weighted bourbon um the first weed and bourbon they had yeah i'll have to go back and yeah Uh, but it it was was really good so it's not like it's not like i think heaven hill doesn't have good weed and bourbon um aging i just didn't think this one was (laughs) i didn't think this one hit the mark so um i mean but yeah to the all your point we're all gonna buy it if we see it on the shelf. I mean, it, at least one bottle. You know, if I see multiple, I'm not gonna like stock yeah. up on them or anything. But um, that bottle is too hard to pass up if you see it on the shelf. Um, so, do you think this could be a start to the '70s decanter trend that was going on back then? Hmm. Oh yeah, I mean, you you see it across the board. If something works, everyone else jumps on. Um, I mean, just in the the raised proof or the barrel proof releases, barrel proof releases really didn't start coming around until, I mean, you, you know, there's always one or two, but four or five years ago when everything started hitting, you know, Elijah Craig started doing it out of the gift shop. Then it became an actual release a couple of times. And then, it, you know, three, four times a year now, then Stag Jr., Pretty much everyone has a barrel proof release. Even um, makers, yeah, makers comes yeah. out with makers cast strength. Um, yeah. So I, I think we'll, uh, which we kind of already are seeing a lot of these brands come out with you know these ornate bottles. Um, well, you know, a few years ago, I.W. Harper did that fifteen year release. Yeah, that was a throwback to straight seventies, yeah. right? Well, I, that's cool true because there's that one, you know, as. Um, we already mentioned the, uh, the Al Young's was a throwback bottle. So, yeah. um, and actually I just, I just realized me and Max have matching hats or no, I'm not wearing that hat. I do have that hat, <laughs> but I'm not wearing that. I am wearing the bourboner hat. Is that a Willet hat? Four roses hat, but close enough. Oh, really? Hold on. Turn it around. That's so funny. pretty. I bought pretty much the exact same hat, but it's Willet. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see they're buying from the same supplier, <laughs> just like their grains. I'm teaming up. Yeah. So the other thing that, that is interesting about the the decanter side is that yeah. you know in the '70s it was to try to reinvigorate people to buy stuff. 
now it's about capitalizing on the market, right? It's about saying like, we have a market. We have people that are going to buy this. So we're going to go ahead and I don't know. I've seen people that said $30 whiskey, $80 bottle, right? Like that's how they're kind of justifying, you know, what, what it, it kind of is inside there. I mean, I've even seen people that said like, hell, just go get the $20 or $30 old fits, um, bottle and bond, just the regular stuff. And I think you'll be happier. Um, you know, at the end of the day, right? Buy an empty bottle off the secondary. <laughs> or do that, right? <laughs> you know, the one thing, so, uh, well, and you got a bottle of this, Kenny, so we haven't picked up ours yet, but really cool decanter, right? Super cool, and I'm sure it'll be functional down the road, but the only thing that keeps annoying me is it's a, it's a cork, right? It's like a real cork, and I'm like, all right, so this is a cool decanter until this thing dries out, and you're like, yeah. oh, crap. I, if Heaven Hill is smart, they'd almost sell like a, you know, when the series completes, like a, just a plastic or whatever top that would match. You could just pop in and then you could actually use this for a while. Or if someone's smart, they'd just come up and start selling those to begin with. But, I'll, mention um, it. I'll mention it to the design team. I'll there you go. I mean, it's just, I keep looking at this going, super cool bottle. They want people to use this as a decanter until the cork dries out, then people will be pissed. And so, so. when you, you know, you make a, a pretty good point, Jordan, and I'll, I'll throw this your way. Could this be a collector's item and even to say in five years when you get all the spring and fall releases and you try to sell it as a lot like can it be a collector's item sure it could be i mean every day that you go out and see all the different lots that are up for sale right like you you'll see people drop crazy stuff like a mm -hmm. no one would have thought the birthday series would have been a huge lot right but then you'll see someone drop like a when did the series start oh three oh two something like that right and someone's thrown up the whole series for a few thousand dollars. And you're like, well, well, what just happened here? So you, I guarantee you it's going to be a lot that 100%. someone's going to sell for a lot of money just because people want to collect stuff and sell stuff. Even right? the I E.H. Mean, Taylor series, you think about the tornado was a gimmick. And then Sour Mash know, was a super gimmick. Yeah. Sour yeah. Mash too. Like, Good luck um, buying one now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're individually way more expensive than anyone, you know, uh, what I ever thought, but it, it kind of everyone wants that series or, or you know, just the full collection. Yeah, I think this will do well because it's a cool looking bottle, right? So, this is even if I shouldn't say that, I was going to say, even if bourbon goes out of style, people will still want that. If that was the case, people wouldn't have all these old decanters of Jim Beam and others that are, you know, I saw someone post like a Jim Beam boxcar train edition the other day. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. But I guarantee you when bourbon crashed in the 80s, someone was like, what the hell do I want this for, right? Or like the Chessman set or stuff like that. So you might have to hold on to it for a long time if that's the case. But um, I, I think this one will do well holding up its value and, and being a collector's item. I'll play a little devil's advocate on this okay. one, right? Because when I think about it, sure, like it looks cool. It probably makes even a better like, um, you know, background if you were sitting there watching on video and looking at it. But here's the other thing is that shit's hot right now, right? Yeah. And that I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that are thinking the exact same thing versus people that were buying old force of birthday bourbon in 2003 and 2004 weren't necessarily thinking like, I want to hold on to this for like 10 years or 15 yeah. years. And then I'm going to create a whole series of it. They probably weren't thinking that, right? Like, because back then it was just kind of like, Oh, it's just a, just a thing. Right. So I don't know. I, I think, I think it's one of those things that, if it is a collector series still at the end of five years and they're done with it and even six years, seven years at the end of it, like two years after there's going to be so many of them out there that they're, I don't think the value is really going to truly be Maybe. there for a long, long time. Maybe, but then you throw stuff out from the orphan barrel series and that just kind of blows up that whole theory. Right. Cause like, Oh, blowhard, they still made a ton of it, but you look at the price that that's going for and that people on their collection or sell a whole collection with it. And you're like, wait a second. They made so many bottles in this, and this is recent, and you're still willing to pay for that. So throwing a really cool design bottle, and yeah, maybe. I, by the way, I'm not encouraging anyone to like get the series and start hoarding it because, in my mind, that's crazy talk. But I think there's a lot better bourbons that you can go chase down and actually enjoy if you have to end up cracking if they lose their value than this. But that's just me. Yeah, I feel bad for all the guys who were trading George T. Stag for him right at the beginning when they came out. Oh. I know, right? Yeah, the I mean, old Barter House. Uh, I remember just hounding my local Total Wine, and they finally got Barter House in, and I'm like flying to the store, <laughs> <laughs> hoping nobody beats me there. And then there was like 
four hundred thousand bottles of it released. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will say I will say though, me and me and Nick and Eric talk about this often, right? Butterhouse isn't a great bourbon. It's not a bad bourbon, no. but it's just an average bourbon, right? But show me another twenty year and granted age doesn't really make a bourbon better, right? But if you're into high ages, show me a better 20 year value out there right now. Mm -hmm. It's not, right? You're not going to find another 20 year bottle of bourbon out there for 80 bucks. Not saying it's great. I'd pick a ton of other bottles ahead of that. But that's the one bottle that I always scratch my head. I'm like, why? why? Not that you were ripping on it, but why are people like ripping on Barter House? Like, that's the value if you're into age, right? It makes no sense to me. Yeah, I just don't know why people are into. Oh, I agree 100%. Don't get me wrong, right? (laughs) Don't get me wrong. I don't know why people are into a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> Within bourbon and outside of bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So we'll uh, we'll wrap this yeah. up. One last topic for the night. And this was one that actually Max had talked about is that, uh, you know, Bob Dylan has now released his line of whiskey. You've got Matthew McConaughey that's released his own line of whiskey. Do you think this is the uh, the beginning of something crazy of, you know, rock stars or actors or um, people on the bourbon community roundtable celebrities that are going to be creating their own line of bourbon? Like, what do you guys think is going to be the end of this? We know Mila Kunis has a bourbon coming too. So there's another one to throw in there. Hold on. What? She does? That's, so I've, I've heard the same told. thing too. Yeah. Did I miss that? She's got a, she's got a barrel Virginia. in there with her name on it. So what I was told, at least when I was there, in January, well, I knew she has the barrel, but they're going to take that and blend it in with others that with the with that were distilled in the same. <laughs> they distilled in the same week or day or whatever, and do something something with it. I'll buy that. They were. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, if Drake getting his own whiskey didn't didn't cause a celebrity crash to start, then nothing. There you going go. To. Can't, so. can't forget about good old Drizzy Drake. I mean, one thing I really refuse to do on this ago. podcast is talk bad about Drake. So <laughs> you know, go down that road. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I would, I wish I could end the show doing it, but I don't want to get sued and ask for royalties. So we, we can't, we can't, but uh, yeah, no, dis- no music playing. Diss track about the rap. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not so much dissing him, but I'm just saying, like, I mean, if, you know, I, I, if he's coming out with stuff and that didn't cause anything to crash, then I think if anything that shows that anyone can create a whiskey brand and throw it out there. Right. Yeah, I, I think you're just going to see more and more of the celebrity endorsements yeah. because it's worked. I mean, you think about the Matthew McConaughey stuff. Yep. I, I don't know exact numbers, but I have to think that that's been a very successful thing for, um, well, Campari, but Wild Turkey. For sure. Um, so, you know, people are going to pick up on that. And I, I'm kind of surprised. I, I guess Beam does have uh, Mila Kunis. Um, her, and then I don't know. I think Old Forester getting in with the Statesman was Which is probably actually a really cool. good bourbon, though. Um, yeah. but I think you'll just see more and more of that <clears throat> celebrity endorsement because bourbon is it, bourbon's cool at this point. So, yeah. you know, if you can find the right star to back it, it just um, pushes the brand even further. Yeah, and like Jordan said about good ones, the the Bob Dylan rye it's called heaven's door it's actually really freaking good it's a six-year mgp rye oh has anybody tried it yet Is yeah i got no, you I tried got some samples of it the, okay they have a tennessee bourbon a double barreled whiskey and then the rye whiskey and the other two i, I suspect dickel sourcing they're not not exactly my palate but the rye surprised the hell out of me the surprise the rye is really good it's six-year mgp rye finished in oak barrels that used to hold cigars so it's kind of it's kind of really? like a smooth mm-hmm. ambler old scout rye that's a little watered down and just a tad smokier interesting so they did it from old cigar barrels yeah i've got the hold on i've got the sheet it's some kind of fancy name because that's um so i went to this drew estates barn smoker uh, and I didn't realize this, like how they're doing that tobacco. He was saying they took for like the Pappy Van Winkle cigar, they took 500 pounds of tobacco, yep. pressed it with like, um, was it hydraulic lifts into these barrels and let it ferment or I, I guess not ferment, but just age, right? just age the in there. Um, but I can't imagine that 
is palatable to put whiskey back into that. I don't know. It could. says it's a uh, Vosages Oak, V O S G E S, from v Vosage. I'm What's probably the... sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. France. It says they used to hold uh, cigar tobacco. But... What's the proof on that? 95? All right. So 95 proof. I'm sure 92. they chill filter it until exactly they get the flavor profile 92. they want. So. It's actually yeah, massage oak is just like you know, like we use a lot of white American oak or American white oak. So that's the type of oak. But man, that's interesting. I don't know, but you better get your mind right on Tennessee whiskey, man. It's gonna blow up. It's the next big thing. Oh yeah, stock <laughs> up now. Clear the shelves. <laughs> <laughs> Good things are coming. But uh, so there's the last thing, uh, John Belushi, that's in chat. He was saying, yeah, there should be, uh, he's actually, his name's John Belushi in here. So there's John Belushi bourbon, Animal House bourbon, Toga bourbon. Yeah, you can just <laughs> go on with that. Um, so got to gotta love the Animal House references. But with that, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up for tonight. So uh, another solid show in the books. Fellas, I want to say thank you for coming on again. I want to give you one more opportunity to wrap it up, let people know, uh, you know, where you uh, where you blog at? Um, you know what's your what's your grill on this weekend? Right, it's a bourbon or eats kind of weekend for uh, uh, for Memorial Day. I know this is going to be coming out on Thursday, so it's going to be a little bit past it. So, uh, what what did you grill? Slash, are you going to grill? Uh, so, Blake, you're gonna go last since you are bourbon or eats. So, uh, okay, <laughs> go first, buddy. <laughs> Max, you're up first. Oh, sorry, I didn't catch that. Yeah, Max here, superflybourbonclub.com, Instagram, Facebook, whole nine yards. Got uh, probably two or three articles coming within the next few weeks. Got the, you know, of course, got to review the old Baldy 2. Uh, got a review of this guy coming, the Heaven's Door Rye. And then the other one, you'll see it when it comes out. So, yeah, check us out. And um, today I grilled burgers. Tomorrow I'm uh, smoking a brisket. Nice. So we'll we'll see how the how the day goes, but I I predict it to be a good day. Good deal, Jordan. You're up next, bud. Cool. See if you can top brisket. All right. So this is Jordan from uh, BreakingBourbon.com. I'm one of three guys. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and of course Patreon at Breaking Bourbon. We do reviews, articles, and our up to the minute uh, release calendar. And tomorrow, I have set aside some prime ribeye caps that I'm going to be grilling. Oh, man, that sounds delicious, too. <laughs> a year ago, I didn't even know what those were. <laughs> the sweet deliciousness is what they are. And you start yeah. going to Costco, and you're like, ooh, look how marbled those are. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. Mm -hmm. All right, am I up? I yep. am Blake from Bourboner, uh, bourboner.com, B-O-U-R-B-O-N-R, um, on all your on all your social media outlets and so i did a pork loin that if you check out instagram stories today um it'll be on there and i'll save it to my profile so i spent like hours trying to edit these videos <laughs> on my iphone to post them to instagram stories and for some reason in my mind i'm thinking the stories allowed you 45 seconds it doesn't it's only 15 seconds. So then I had to have find another program that split it up by 15 second increments, <laughs> do this whole thing again. So I don't know if I'm going to continue with uh, recipes on Instagram stories, but we'll see. It's a lot of work. And so tomorrow we're expecting, well, not expecting it's hundred percent chance of rain. So I'm kind of planning by ear on if I want to just grill between the rain or um, try to get like a long, long smoke in. So we're, We'll see. Um, maybe some prime rib, maybe a brisket. Not quite sure yet. Maybe a brisket. You probably should start like right now if you're going to say maybe a brisket, right? <laughs> nah, nah. <laughs> you, you, the uh, Myron Mix and Hunt and Fast Method, you can you can knock that thing out in seven hours. Yeah, oh, this is man. bourbon or eats, okay? He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing I know. Food and bourbon. I spend way too much time researching. <laughs> <laughs> and diapers, you know, we're finding discounts on diapers now too. Oh yeah, right? no, no, that's Amazon Prime. You just sign up for the annual subscription or the monthly subscription for annual or for Amazon Prime, you're all set. There you go. <laughs> so, fellas, I want to say thank you for joining. Uh, for me, grilling. Um, I'm gonna just be American as hell and just I'm just doing burgers, man. It's just oh, about yeah. as nice, a classic, as, maybe yeah. nice, 
maybe get some bison, maybe bison burgers, Ooh. spice it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Little buffalo, change it up, little try change to, it. Uh, yeah. yeah, try to keep it nice and gamey a little bit. Who knows, right? There you go. But uh, again, fellas, thank you for for joining tonight. Make sure that everybody's following these guys on social media. Follow us as well, uh, Bird Pursuit on Instagram, Twitter, as well as Facebook. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, wherever you get your your podcasts. Uh, you can also watch the videos that happen on Facebook and YouTube. If you have any hate mail or any uh, social suggestions, anything like that, make sure you send us an email. It's the duo, T H E D U O at bourbonpursuit.com. We do read every single email that comes in. And if you do like what you hear, make sure you support the show. Go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash bourbonpursuit. And you can sign up there to get cool things such as like, uh, I don't know, maybe a bourboner and bourbon pursuit uh, barrel of bourbon. Because uh, we did one, like barrel with two L's and two R's. Like you should go there and check it out. Um, so with that, I will say thank you guys once again. And with that, we will see you all next week. <laughs>